Thank you very much. Um, you're going to learn today um, about a therapy that you've unlikely heard about, and if you have heard about, you may not understand. I'm an oxygen man, <clears throat> and I believe that oxygen is the fundamental essence of life, of our health, of anti-aging. And it's been published uh, repeatedly that the more oxygen we consume, the younger we are and the healthier we are. Oxygen consumption by our body may be the greatest anti-aging factor that there is. And I think you'll find after this presentation that oxidation therapy is not something to fear. We've all been trained to think that free radicals are bad, and there's another side to the story. Um, as far as conflicts of interest, I don't have any. Uh, the status of the FDA devices, uh, uh, as far as the status, none of these are approved by the FDA for anything. Uh, you can get, uh, if you're interested in oxidation therapy, you can get some devices and use them off-label. But regarding FDA, I have a challenge for anybody, and I'm willing to take care of this after my presentation. If you can name me one FDA-approved synthetic petrochemical pharmaceutical that cures any disease, I'll give you a crisp, brand-new $100 bill to the first person who can do that. Absolute Must Reading. This is a terrific book, Into the Light, by William Campbell Douglas, Second Opinion Publishing. And another book that's available online is called Utopia, Unified Theory of Air Oxygen Participation in Erebosis. This is a terrific book. It's available online. It details for you hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands, of references on hydrogen peroxide and oxidation metabolism in the body. And that free radical metabolism is not something to be feared. I published an article uh, <clears throat> several years ago called Ultraviolet Blood Irradiation Therapy, Photooxidation, the Cure that Time Forgot, and that's the first part of the presentation. Well, more than a century ago, in the late 1800s, ultraviolet was used to inactivate toxins, kill microorganisms, including tuberculosis. Consider that microorganisms have had several billion years on this planet to get resistant to ultraviolet, and to date, they haven't. Ultraviolet is used to inactivate vaccines, including rabies, and it can destroy toxins such as diphtheria, ricin, tetanus, and snake venom. In the 1930s, a German named Gervich found that there is an ultraviolet metabolism in the body. He called it tiny emanations, mitogenic rays, and these are ultraviolet photons released by our tissues when we're sick we emit more, we lose more ultraviolet energy. Smokers emit more. When you quit smoking, you actually retain your ultraviolet. Blood components store ultraviolet energy. Well, we know that from vitamin D, cholesterol, and double bonds can absorb ultraviolet photons and hold it for up to nine months, excuse me, 42 weeks, 10 months, to expose a UV-sensitive photographic plate. So Emmett Knott, knowing this, was a Harvard PhD physicist. He happened to notice buzzards flying in the sky and avoiding carcasses in the sun. They preferred those in the shade. He believed that ultraviolet from the sun had something to do with preventing decomposition, and he developed the technique of extracorporeal blood irradiation. Previous to this, the physicians were irradiating the skin with ultraviolet, but it was found that if you exsanguinated an arm, took the blood out, you lost the effect. So he knew that blood had an effect. So what he did was give <coughs> dogs infections. He irradiated their whole blood, their whole blood volume with ultraviolet. The infections cleared. The dogs died. Well, <coughs> he found out that if he limited the exposure to one and a half cc's per pound, that all of the dogs died and the dogs got cleared of infection. At that time, in the 1920s, he was using a liquid mercury bulb, water cue, cooled, the equivalent of 200 watts. His first case was in 1928 on a terminally ill septic woman. She was dying of an illegal abortion. Abortions were illegal at the time. Well, at that time, all women, or most women, would die. She went on and survived after a single treatment and went on to have children. That created the not technique of ultraviolet blood irradiation therapy. 
following his successful introduction into American medicine, there was a plethora of literature in the American journals detailing the effectiveness of this therapy. In fact, the effectiveness on infection was so unbelievable that the authors went to pains to describe the magnitude of seriously, critically ill people horribly infected and recovering very promptly with this. Here's one. This says, this was a female, age 11, with generalized peritonitis and an appendiceal abscess due to a perforation of a gangrenous appendix. On admission, the temperature was 105 degrees. One treatment, 120 cc's of blood, and you can see the detoxification and the fever curve. She was out within a couple days. Detoxification was completed 72 hours. Now, that's just one treatment. Maybe somebody was really seriously infected. I would think a gangrenous appendix would be pretty bad. But th these are published in the American literature, incidentally. This is at the Portland Sanitarium Hospital. In this particular case, it was a colon bacillus septicemia due to acute pyelitis. This patient had a temperature of 108.4, received the treatment of 290 cc's, and then you can see the fever curve dropped precipitously. And just for insurance, they gave a second treatment here, and the patient was discharged a few days later. Please remember, this was before the days of antibiotics. This is when people were dying. In the Review of Gastroenterology, January, February 1943, this is one of the <coughs> researchers, George Miley, and also Rebic. In generalized peritonitis, they had 32 cases. Average detox time was about 80 hours for complete detoxification. Of the moderately advanced, 100% recovered. Of the moribund, people who were dying, over 50% recovered. One or two treatments. Now, we have a crisis in the world today with antibiotic-resistant Staph aureus. This is from the American Journal of Surgery, June 1944. In these particular cases, there were seven. These are Staph aureus. If you notice the result, unfortunately for these people, all of them died. However, this was the advent of sulfa drug therapy, and these people were placed on sulfa drugs, sulfanilamide or others, except for the last one. And the, the uh, doctors said to themselves, hmm, we wonder, why are these people dying? Let's find out if it's the sulfa. So they did several more, staph aureus, staph aureus. Here's incomplete septic abortion, pretty serious infections. These people did not receive sulfa except the first until they found out that it was uh, staph, then they stopped it. All of these people recovered. The number of treatments were all but... All of them were either one or two sessions. People are dying today, and yet one or two treatments of this would take care of the problem. This is in the American Journal of Surgery, June uh, 1947. I think we'll see the reference in a moment. This says the results of 445 cases of acute pyogenic infection given UBI at the Hahnemann Hospital in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Now, as a case control study, when you do 250 cases in a row, you can probably eliminate the double-blind controlled study because they took 250 people in a row out of this 445 cases. These were pretty serious infections. Purpureal sepsis, abscesses, salpingitis, osteomyelitis, um, septicemia. In the osteomyelitis cases, 25 of 26 survived. 